So uh, the idea, super simple, we're calling this story time. Each week we're looking at a parable of Jesus. Parable is just a story. That's all it is. And the Bible is full of amazing stories. And, and we're looking at these and we're really just making sure we understand what Jesus was trying to stress in these stories. And we're going to be talking about a famous parable tonight in Matthew's gospel chapter 20. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But really this, this parable is all about work and, and hard work. And what is the reward and why are we doing what we're doing? Where's the benefit? Where's the, the payoff? How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? I was thinking about um, my little guy, Reese, years ago. I don't know where he, he really got this, but he came to me one day and he said, Dad, I want to do chores. And I was like, okay, this, this, is, this is good. I mean, he was probably four or five little. He was like, I want to make some money and, uh, and, and I want to go to the, the uh, store and I want to get a toy. It's like, okay, all right, all right, all right. This is a good parent moment. This is a good father, son. He's going to carry on the family name. It's my opportunity to what? Instill a hard work ethic, values. And so he had these, they're adorable, these cute little John Deere working gloves. And I remember we were outside and I was like, all right, this is what we're doing. We're going we're gonna to trim these hedges. I'm going to cut them. And then I want you to just make the little piles of the leaves. And, and then we're going to put them in a bag. And then we'll, we'll throw them away when we're done. And so, you know, he's excited, and we're out there, and, and we are working. But then some questions started coming up. <laughs> and it didn't take all that long but before I heard, like, hey, Dad, how long is this going to take? And it was like, hey, Dad, do these gloves make your hands itchy? It was like, hey, Dad, is it hot out here? Hey, Dad, what do you think Mom's doing? And then it was, uh, hey, Dad, can I go back inside and play on the iPad and have some apple juice? And I actually let him, which is probably not good, and I'm pretty sure I ended up buying the toy anyway, which is a parenting fail. Anyway, I just, I, I, you know, we want to know what is in it. If we're going to work hard for something, we want to know what, what the payoff is. Here's something that I learned by deep and I mean deep revelation of the Holy Spirit when it comes to work. He showed me something about my marriage. And I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but he showed me that this whole we versus me concept. And I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this, is, this has been my experience. Like, like Kate can ask me, or she'll, she'll tell me rather, hey, babe, we need to clean the flower bed. Hey, babe, we need to trim the trees. We need to take out the trash. We need to paint the room. But of course, what happens? We means me. It's like there's no we involved in the manual labor department. Anytime the we comes up, I, I know deep revelation, like I told you, she's talking about me, just me specifically. How many of you guys can relate to that? So I think this is pretty cool in the Bible the disciples, they, they got a little Q&A. They want to know how is this really going to work? Because, you know, I'm sure you, most of you, you have jobs. I hope you have jobs. Probably none of you are going to go to work tomorrow and, and you're going to be like, hey, boss, um, you know what? We're good. You don't even have to pay me. Like, I love this so much. I'm just going to keep coming and I'm going to show up and uh, yeah, we're, we're good. That's probably not going to be your approach. And certainly the disciples, which I, I think is honestly kind of hilarious, they want to know what's in it for them. And so really, Jesus, this parable that he's about to tell, it, it's kind of answering this question. This is Matthew 19. I'm going to back up just a, a second to verse 27. It says, Peter said to him, he's talking to Jesus, he says, listen, we've been or, or we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? And Jesus replied, I, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones. You're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel and anyone who has given up houses, brothers, sisters, fathers. Man, I mean, these people gave up a lot to follow Jesus. He said, listen, anybody that's given up these things, children, property, for my sake... He will receive a hundred times as much in return, and he will inherit eternal life. And then, then here's, the, here's the kicker. God's about to explain something. Jesus is about to explain something that's different about his, his pay scale. 
It's different about his labor and the work and the reward. And so he finishes this thought out, and he says, many who are the greatest now, they're going to be the least important then. And those that seem least important now, they will be the greatest then. In other words, he's telling us that that his pay scale and how this is going to play out is not necessarily the way that the world pays. How many of you guys know the Bible says the Lord is faithful and he is a rewarder of what? Those who diligently seek him. And it is important, and God stressed the importance in his scripture so that you and I could understand, no, actually, we're not just doing this for nothing. There there is a tremendous payday coming. And so his response really to that that Q&A, that question, is Matthew 20, and it's this famous parable. It's commonly referred to as the parable of the vineyard worker, and I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to hit you with the CGB edition, the Chris George Bates edition uh, on this parable. And it's, it's a short parable, and you've probably heard it before, but I think the, the, the meaning is very profound. So the parable, if you're not familiar, is, is basically the Bible says there's a farmer. He's preparing a vineyard. I'm going to call him a rancher for the rest of this story. So he goes out, and he needs the crop harvested. That, that, that's, that's his goal. That's what he's trying to accomplish. And Scripture essentially just says he goes, and he wants to hire workers, laborers. I can envision a rancher in a pickup truck and he pulls up and and he's looking for a day laborer. He's looking for a ranch hand out there. And he's like, all right, hey, listen, I need four guys. Y'all get in. They jump in the back of his truck. Seen that happen a thousand times. And he's, he's got a good reputation, by the way. He pays well. And they know the man pays well. They know he's going to do what he says he's going to do. And so he drops them off, and, and, and they're harvesting the crop. They're mending the fences. They're doing whatever the vineyard workers would do, whatever a ranch hand might do. But the Bible says that a couple hours went by, and he needs more workers, it needs more manpower, more laborers. So he gets in the truck, he goes back, hey, I, I need three or four more guys. I'm paying good, I'm paying a good wage here. And so what happens? They jump in the back of the truck, they're good, he drops them off, it's around lunchtime. Scripture says, and then later on in the day, a little, little bit closer to quitting time, maybe three, four o'clock, he gets another crew. They come in and they're working. And then at the end of the day, when it's real close to quitting time, we'll just say five, six o'clock, he goes back and he needs even more workers for his ranch. And so the rancher pulls up, he gets four more, he takes them out, they're working, and then they call it a day. Then the the story goes in, in Matthew 20 that he says, Foreman, get out there and pay these guys. And I want you to start with those guys that came in at the very end. And I want you to pay them. And and it was a generous amount. And and so those guys come up and, and, you know, they had only been there maybe an hour. And and so the foreman, he goes over there, he pulls out the wallet, and I mean, boom, he he hits them with like a a couple hundos, a couple hundred dollar bills. Like, wow, this, this is impressive. I've been here an hour, this is pretty good money. And, and then so he goes down a little bit further and the guys that showed up about three o'clock, they get, they get a couple hundred bucks. Then, and then the guys that got there at 12 o'clock, they got a couple hundred bucks. And you better believe these guys that got there at 6 a.m., they're thinking, man, I mean, this is amazing. There is no, I saw him give the first guy 200 bucks. There's no telling how much he's about to hit us with. But then of course, what happens? The Bible says they get the same amount. And they're indignant about it. They don't like that. They're saying, you know, I've been doing some calculating and this does not quite seem fair. We've been here in the sun working hard all day long. You, you paid these guys the exact same amount. They literally worked an hour. We've been here all day. And then the Bible tells us his response, which, which I believe is honestly profound. He tells them, he says, uh, didn't you and I agree on, on an honest day's, day's wage? Didn't I pay you what I told you I was going to do? And they're like, yeah. He said, didn't I, didn't I pay you a good amount? Wasn't I generous to you? And I paid you exactly what we agreed about. And then they're like, yeah. And he said, so why do you want to begrudge my generosity? He said, listen, it's my money. And if I want to bless them, 
And, and if I want to pay them, what business is it of yours? He said, it's my money, and I'm going to bless, and I'm going to prosper whoever I want. And then the parable ends. You know, I, I, I thought about that a lot, and I read that a lot this week. Read it, w- read it in different translations, looked at the context that it was in, and, and everything. And I really believe the Holy Spirit showed me three things about that. And I, and I really, I'm telling you, I think they're so profound right now for this exact moment that we all find ourselves in. Especially this part about the first will be last and the last will be first. The, the first thing that I really want to point out to you in this parable is that, man, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. In this story, in this case, obviously they're, they're, they're reaping a crop. But in the world today, did you know there is a lot of work that needs to be done? Did you know that? If you didn't know that, go turn on your TV when we get home, and you'll be able to tell that right away. Here's something that I hear a lot, and honestly, to me, sometimes I think it's kind of strange. I hear a lot of of comments and people talk about millennials and a lot of the negative connotation towards sort of being a millennial. And and I was just, I was looking up some stats and statistics uh, these last couple weeks as I was reading. Think about this for just a moment. I, I hear things as a pastor. I hear this said a lot in the media and by people. I hear people say things, especially about this generation, that it, it's, it's dumb. It's clueless. Dumb kids. Only thing they know how to do is order lattes and play on their phones. I hear, I hear stuff like that a lot. How many guys know what I'm talking about? I, I hear it a lot, which is honestly a pretty bizarre way to evangelize. I mean, if you were going to reap a harvest, if you're going to reap a crop from that group of people, that's, that's, that would be a pretty strange way to do that. I cannot find a biblical precedent to insulting the people that you want to reach. And so I was, I was thinking about this today. You know what's crazy? Is, is it millennials we're talking about for, for a moment? I'm going to tell you why. They're not even really the young people in society right now. What's, what's crazy, you may not even realize this, is that millennials are the largest group of adults in the United States of America by far. It's actually not even close anymore. They're, they're, they're literally 25 to 39, and there's more millennial adults in America than baby boomers or any other generation. In 2018, they, be, they are and still the largest voting block of people in the United States. In this young generation that's actually coming up right now, from grade school age up to about 24, they're not even millennials. They're called Gen Z. And here's the horrible problem, is that those two generations in particular are so unlikely to know God. They're so unlikely to go to church. They're so unlikely to hear the truth. So when Jesus says this crop and this harvest is huge, it's everywhere, it's so big, and and he needs laborers, that is exactly what he's talking about. In in fact, listen to something that Jesus said to to stress this point over in Matthew 9. It says, Jesus traveled through all the towns, the villages in that area, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news about the kingdom. He healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he insulted them. When, When he saw the crowds, he said, these are the dumbest people I've ever seen. When he saw the crowds... He belittled them. When he saw the crowds, he mocked them. Is that in your Bible? When he saw the crowds, what did he do? He says, he had compassion on them. Compassion. He says he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And he said to the disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are so few, so pray. Notice, he said, so pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. You know what's incredible? It's God's in charge of the harvest. The the harvest is God's. I mean, it's not hard to find people exactly like this that are what? That are confused and helpless. I know a whole bunch of them. If you want, like right after church, go to Walmart. They're all there right now. Like they're all over the place. 
But, but he said he had compassion on them. And then notice, I, I think this is pretty interesting. He, he said, you don't have to pray to God. He'll take care of the harvest. You don't have to pray and say, God, we need a harvest. We need a harvest. He said, no, the harvest is everywhere. It, it's everywhere. It's all over culture. It's in your college. It, it's, in, it's the people that you work with. It's the people in this community. The harvest is enormous. But notice, what did he say to do? He said, spend your time praying specifically that I will send more workers into the field. So, so man, if you, you want to bring a, a crop of people that don't know Jesus well, let me help you with your approach. Get more labor. Get more people in the game. Get more boots on the ground, and you go out, and we will bring this harvest in together. I've never in my life seen people more desperate and more confused and honestly more helpless. And I know they're searching for so much in life that will fulfill them and will sustain them. And I'm going to tell you something. They will find, if, if we'll help them, they'll find what I found and what so many of you have found is that that can only be found through Jesus. Amen. There's nothing else. We, we, we can help them and save them so much time by pointing to the one that will provide what they are looking for, whether they know it or not. But, it, but he looked at them, and I love this, this, that it says he was moved with compassion. The harvest is everywhere. It's, it's, in fact, it's bigger now than certainly at any point in my lifetime. I think it's interesting to point out in this parable, this, this rancher, this farmer, uh, he's unusually generous. He pays well, especially with the ones that jumped in at the very end. And again, Hebrews eleven six says, God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I think it's interesting that, you know, Jesus, he didn't really rebuke the disciples when they said, hey, listen, what, what is this? What's in this for us? Like we've left our homes, we've left our business, we're following you. Jesus really didn't reprimand them. No, there is a reward coming. There really is a payday coming. No, he didn't want them focusing on the reward. He wanted them to focus on the work, and then the reward, what? It would take care of itself. That, that was his model, and that's what he demonstrated. But I, I just want you to know the reward, is, is, it's, it's coming. Man, it, it could be coming quick for all I know. Matthew 20, verse 8, in this parable, it says, That evening he told the foreman, call the workers in, pay them, beginning with the last worker first, and then those that were hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received full day's wage. It says, but then those that he hired, they came to get their pay, and they assumed they would get more. But they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested the owner. Those people worked only one hour. And yet you paid them as much as you paid us who've worked all day. Listen to me. There, there's a point here in this story where, where the Bible, when he says the first will be last and the last will be first, the pay scale's a lot different. He, he was really instilling them, and, and you can see in the Gospels, because he mentioned it in several other instances, that the way to get ahead, the way to get a big reward is what? It's to be the servant of all. He said, you want to, whoever wants to be the greatest among you, let that person be the biggest servant. Let them outlove everyone. Let them outserve everyone. And you watch and see what that will do to their life. And I'm going to tell you right now, the fastest way to wreck your life and to make your life miserable is to live it to where it's all about you. That's the fastest way to do it. I don't know of anything that will wreck your life faster and make you more miserable than just living for yourself and not thinking about this reward, not thinking about, well, well I actually have a job to do. I'm a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. I, I have a king, actually, that I should very much be mindful that I'm representing everywhere I go. It's easy to represent this king at church, if you didn't know that. Very, very easy to represent him here right now. It's not as easy to represent him out tomorrow when we're working or wherever we go. 
That's actually what being a worker and a laborer is all about, bringing in this harvest. But he pays well, pays very well. You know, the Bible also tells us, 2 Corinthians 9, it says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds, he's gonna get a small crop. The one that plants generously, he'll get a generous crop. And you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves what? A cheerful giver, someone that gives their life away. Yes, obviously he's talking about financially. Life is not just about them. They wanna give to good causes that help spread and build God's kingdom. And then notice he says, and God will generously provide all that you need. And then you'll always have everything that you need and plenty left over to share. I've learned and I've seen this modeled for me, but the happiest people that I know are also the most generous and selfless people that I know. It goes hand in hand. Uh, it's more blessed, what did Jesus say, to give than it is to receive. And so God's, God's pay scale is different. And you really, honestly, it would do you well to think that, you know, yeah, man, you can invest and you can save money and you can store up, I guess, some treasure here. Obviously, it's going to decay. But you can live a life and I can live a life where, man, we're storing up treasure in heaven. And the Bible says it's incorruptible. It will be there forever. You know, yesterday, I'm just going to be totally honest with you. Um, I was in a bad mood. Some of you are like, oh. seriously, I was, I was not, actually, I was, not, I was not in a good mood yesterday. Two or three times a decade, it happens. And I'm just, I don't, I had, I was not in a great mood. I was just kind of feeling sorry for myself. I was just thinking about the news and just the craziness. And, and I was just thinking like kind of internally, I was like, God, here I am. I'm going to be 40 years old in a couple weeks and literally nothing that I planned is, is happening according to plan. And, and I was just kind of feeling sorry for myself. And I was like, does this even matter, God? <laughs> like, like, like what, what, what am I doing? And God, by the way, like, when is school going to start? And is it actually going to start? Or are we going to homeschool the kids again? Which basically means they're getting no education whatsoever because no one seems to know how to work the Zoom videos properly. All of the online learning I've seen only involves the teachers trying to explain to the parents what in the heck to do, and it's, it's never pretty. So, like, I'm, I'm thinking about these things, and I'm like, you know, when are we going to see our friends again? When, when is things going to go back to normal? And in God's response, the Holy Spirit, honestly, His response, which, which is, is beautiful. He always knows what to tell us. He always knows what to say. He always knows how to speak to us. Listen to this scripture. He says in Galatians 6, 9, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. We'll reap it. Man, it's all in the Bible. Rewards coming. For those that follow God and honor God, when it's tough and they don't feel like it and there's so much uncertainty, man, it's there. I love the way 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, it talks about it. It says, don't you know that when you run a race, all the runners, what? They're running to win. Only one's going to get the prize, so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive something that's perishable, a reef. But we are doing it for something it's imperishable. The Bible talks, like I said, a lot about reward in Scripture. And, and I was just kind of going through, thinking about some of the, the instances that's mentioned in Scripture. There's crowns that are mentioned. And I don't know if they're little, literal. I don't know if they're figurative. But they sound amazing. And there's one called the imperishable crown. It's for followers of Jesus. They sought Him. They sought Him. They were truth seekers. And I know, man, we got truth seekers Tonight watching, they, they, they're seeking something that's real. They're seeking something that won't disappoint. They're seeking something that will sustain. They're, they're seeking truth, something that they can give their life to a worthy cause. And it says this crown is going to the ones that found that. They found the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And there's a crown for that. 
There's a crown called the crown of rejoicing where, where someone, even if they had tremendous sorrow or pain in life, they were able to say, no, God, I'm going to praise you in the storm. I'm going to praise you in this test, this trial. I'm going to praise you during this loss because I know, no, this here is not everything. I know there's another kingdom and I'm a citizen of your kingdom. It's a very real crown and it's a very real reward. Crown of righteousness. It's for those that they could see, you know, man, I, gosh, I can't be good enough. I'm not good enough. And it's, it's, it's a crown for those that say, I, I know who is. And they grabbed a hold of Jesus. They said, hey, this is my righteousness because it's Jesus now that stands in the gap. And I'm going to drop the charade of self-righteousness. The crown of righteousness is for that. The crown of glory. The Bible mentions that this is for those that long for Christ's return. They want him to come back. And, 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 and they've, they've, they've managed to not fall so much in love with this world that they love the world more than they love Jesus. Because there's a huge temptation that we all face. And sometimes the longer that we're here, to be honest, we get super comfortable. We get a little bit more money. We start having a little nicer things. And we forget, man, this isn't even our home. Like we're passing through here. We got a job to do. And it says, man, there is a crown. There's someone watching He's watching our lives. And there's saints that are cheering us on. They're saying, Ben, finish strong. Don't give up. Get, get in the fight. Crown of glory. I love this, the crown of life. The Bible speaks of this very real reward. And it's for Christians that endured great difficulty through the end, suffered. Maybe they were killed. Maybe their families were killed. I, I think of some of the missionaries. I think of some of the people that, that gave us the gospel. They died. They died to get it in our hands. And we can read it so easily now. And sometimes, honestly, we just, we almost think nothing of it. But for thousands of thousands of years, the world was essentially in the dark and they didn't have the gospel. He says, this, this is uh, for the ones that that endured great difficulty in life. I was thinking there was a lady at our, our Fort Worth campus, and I, I, I watched this lady and, and how she would come to church, and she was a single mother, and she had two special needs children. One of them was a paraplegic teenage girl, and I'm just like, mm, great difficulty. It's an understatement. But man, she brought them to church and she made sure they knew the Lord. And I'm sure there were days that was so hard for her to do. I'm sure it was honestly so hard for her to do so many things that we take for granted. But the Bible says, no, somebody's watching and he's a rewarder of those that are faithful and they'll, they'll hold out until the end and they're not overly concerned about what culture screams or, or says you need or have to have. He says, no, don't, don't think for an instant that there's not a payday. No, there's a payday coming. You know, I, I, some of you here, you may be tired. You may be tired of the work. You know, I, some of you, honest to God, you may, you may be grandparents. And, and you're, you're having to raise your grandkids. You're having to raise them because you have kids and, and maybe, man, maybe that was, it was substance abuse or maybe they're not there. And I think about the, the hardship. I, I think about moms and dads working two and three jobs and, and still getting up and coming to church and saying, this is what's important. That, that's endurance. That's, that's patience. And it's important for us to know, yes, our God, our Heavenly Father, He sees it all. Whether, whether we feel like it or not, no, He's watching and He sees it all. And He sees your commitment to His kingdom. And He knows the cost. And you'll never give anything to God and you'll never give anything to God's kingdom that He doesn't take and turn around and bless you more with it. You may not see it quick in this life, but there will be a day, you better, you better make sure there will be a day when you see it and you know, man, the greatest honor of our life will be what did we do for His kingdom? 
It's a, it's a very real reward. Romans 12, verse 11. I love the way the message translation says this. And I just feel like I need to tell this to, to you, to me, somebody watching this online. It says, don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled in a flame. Hey, if you need to, you go get you a sugar-free Red Bull at Quick Trip. I drank one like almost every time right before I preach. He says, listen, you get yourself fueled in a flame. Be alert, servants of the master. We got any servants of the master in this room tonight? He says, be alert. Cheerfully expect it and don't quit in hard times. It says, pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be, I love this, be inventive in hospitality. Be, be creative in how you bless people. Look for creative ways to be used by God. I love a story uh, my dad told us Tuesday. He was, uh, this is exactly what Scripture's talking about. There was a car, it was broke down. I, I think he had a flat tire or something and couldn't get the wheel off. And, and, and my dad, your pastor, he spent a couple hours with the guy. And, 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 and I mean, there was no monetary benefit. There was nothing personal. There's no personal gain involved. This person was from out of town. But over the two and a half hours of, of help, being creative in hospitality, the man was led to the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? Well, God, God wants to use you that way. And he wants to use me that way. And then the stage honestly is set perfectly for that to happen right now. Your life matters. What you do for Jesus matters more than anything else. So faint not, don't give up, don't quit. Somebody's watching and a payday is coming. Uh, last thing, I think it's pretty incredible that he doesn't really seem to be all that concerned about when you start, he just wants you to start. And it, it doesn't really seem to care all that much about what time these guys came and clocked in. I, I had a coworker years ago, and man, this guy knew how to milk the clock. I, I, typically, I'd work the 3 to 11 p.m. shift. Yeah, I was in, in Bible college at the time, and and, uh, and man, he would get there at like 1.30. And man, he had a routine, and, and he would go, and and uh, man, he would, I don't know why, but he would always take the newspaper, and he'd go into the restroom for like 30 minutes. He clocked in, baby. I mean, he is on the clock. And he had a routine. He would shower and moisturize and, and manscape. I don't know what he did. It took him about an hour and a half. And we were like, hey, man, like this is not going to work out well. Just trying to get some extra time on the clock. Funny thing, he didn't work there very long. <laughs> but but I, I remember, like, man, he was, he, was, he was good at milking that clock. The, the thing is about this story, God wants you to start. And yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. He wants you to start now. He doesn't want you to have to wait till the end of your life. You'll miss a lot of treasure that you can store up in heaven if you wait. But you can get going now. You and me, you know, we could have been born in any time in history. But God knew that you could handle 2020. And he knew that you could also handle whatever difficult set of circumstances that you were going to face in your life. He knew that, that you could handle it. He really did. I, I was talking to some of our students a couple weeks ago. And, and uh, obviously, I, I'm, not, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a, a biologist, but I told them, like, do you know the odds of, of you just being born right now? Like, do you know the, the egg and the sperm, like the ratio? And anytime you say sperm in front of teenagers, it gets their attention, okay? Their eyes are like this big. And I was like, do you know the, the hundreds of millions the, the odds for you to be here right now breathing like God wanted you here for a reason. There's no possible way it could be an accident. He said, no, I want you right now in the midst of this because you've got a job to do. That's his message. That's his message to all of us. If we have breath in our lungs, then we're not done and we got a job to do. 
All of us. We, we, we got a job, and so it's impossible for it to be a coincidence. I love the Old Testament story of Esther, and I was thinking a little bit about her. If you're not familiar with the Bible story, it's Esther 4, verse 14 is, is specifically what I'm referring to. But, but she was a teenage girl and essentially wins a beauty pageant in the Old Testament. She gets to become queen. And then she, course, of course, gets a voice in front of the king. And God uses her mightily to save her entire people. But I thought a lot about something that her uncle told her. He said, for if you remain silent in this time, what time? How about 2020? If you remain silent in this time, relief and, and deliverance for the Jews, it will arise from another place. It says, but you and your father's family, you'll perish. But who knows? He says, who, who knows but that you have come to your royal position, me and you, if you didn't know, if we belong to Jesus, we have a royal position. And it says, who knows, your royal position, the reason you have this is for such a time as this. It's time to clock in. It's time to build God's kingdom. Man, it's time to reach our communities. It's time, listen to me, reach your kids and then reach your kids' friends. Make sure they know who Jesus Christ is and make sure they know what he's all about. No, no, God has you here for such a time as this. What happens if a uh, if a generation does not reach the next, I, I love and I appreciate this so much about our church. It's been a major emphasis that we hand the baton and we're continually thinking about what comes next. One of my favorite quotes of all time says, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It says, we did not pass it to our children in their bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and hand it on to them to do the same thing. Ronald Reagan said that about freedom. You could say the exact same thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, it's not going extinct. God will raise up whoever he needs to, but the point is the same. If you want to preserve freedom, which comes through Jesus, then we have to get serious about reaching and reaping this harvest. Can I get an amen? That, that's the message, profound, parable, simple. But you know, uh, we have to point out something Jesus closed it with. He, he actually warned the disciples at the very end of this parable. And, and he really warned them not to, not to begrudge the Christians that would come later. And in fact, Matthew 20, verse 8, he says, he answered one of them and says, friend, I haven't been unfair. They're coming and they're getting paid. He said, didn't you agree to work to this wage? He said, take your money and go. I wanted to pay the last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? No, those that are last now will be first and those who are first will be last. Really, he's telling them, guys, listen to me. Yeah, you, you got a special thing happening. There's no doubt about it. You're, you're going to be rulers, and, and yes, you, you, you put it all on the line. He said, but there's going to be other workers that get in this thing way later, way after the fact. And they may not look like you, and they may not smell like you, and they may not dress like you, and they may not drive what you drive, and they may not like your taste in music, but I love them, and that's the harvest, and we have a job to do to go after them. And he said, don't forget it. It was, it was a warning to them, actually to his disciples. I was thinking uh, about something I, I heard uh, Greg Laurie say, and I've, I've talked, I was actually just talking a few moments ago backstage to dad about the, the Jesus movement. And I don't know, maybe you didn't grow up in church and maybe you're not super familiar with Christianity in America, but it's it's so inspiring to me to, to, to remember some of these great moves of God. Where, where I'm talking hundreds of thousands of people came to know Christ, and in, in this is like around 1969, the summer of love, and, and you had all these, these hippies that were so disenfranchised with the world. 
And then really what they were kind of renouncing was materialism and, and they didn't want to be a part of the normal society that they, they didn't see any real viable options. And so you had hundreds of thousands, really millions all over the world in this movement and many of them turned to drugs. But you know what happened in the middle of that chaos, in the middle of the craziness? Some of them said, hey, you know what? Drugs, they're not working either. There, there better be something else. And in, in Costa Mesa, California, the Jesus movement, the Jesus revolution kicked off and you started having hundreds of thousands of people descend in California so hungry for the truth. I'm telling you, like God is doing something. He's setting a stage. People know the world, it has very little to offer and they need something real and sustainable. And I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart, you, you, you can read about these guys and, 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 and so, so many of them, the, the churches that were started, Calvary Chapel, for instance, uh, one, of the, one of the pioneers, Chuck Smith, and, and then he mentored Greg Laurie. And you're talking millions of people came to know God through these great moves where people were so, honestly, they were so frustrated with, with society. And then in the midst of that, God, he turned it all around and the lost were found. The, the message, this parable, is that this very real harvest that's in our earth right now God's still looking for laborers. He's still looking for workers. He, he's, he's still looking for people that will be a part of a mighty move of God. And you know, we don't know when this harvest is going to be completely reaped. We, we don't know how everything is going to play out. And in the uncertainty and the darkness and in the craziness, we don't know those things. But there's a couple things we do know. We know His grace is sufficient for us. We know that we can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens us. We know that. We know that our needs are met according to His riches and glory. And we can know and rest confident Confidently that it's his mighty work in us. It's his mighty that's going to do exceedingly and abundantly more and greater than we could ever ask for in the name of Jesus. And he wants to use you, every single one of you, and every single one of you watching online to do it. Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, don't forget to share it with your friends and family and click subscribe. For more information, you can head over to VictoryFamilyChurch.com or click the link below.